Okay, um, I think we can get started. Um, thanks for joining us uh, for our economic measurement uh, seminar this afternoon. Um, delighted to have with us today Martin Fleming, who is going to be speaking about his work on enterprise ICT software and services pricing and productivity measurement. Martin is a fellow of the Productivity Institute and he was previously IBM's chief economist and chief analytics officer for many years. And he's also a researcher at the MIT IBM Watson AI lab. Um, and he also works with the US Bureau of Economic Analysis. So great to have you here uh, today, Martin. Um, a few practicalities uh, before we get going. Um, first of all, to note that this session is being recorded. Uh, Martin is going to speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, we will then take questions, but please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box so that we can see them at our end uh, as we go along. Um, when we get to the Q&A uh, session, we will ask you to unmute your microphone and you'll have the opportunity to ask your question directly of Martin. Okay, uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Rebecca. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, to be with you all today. And uh, <laughs> excuse me, as as Rebecca indicated, um, this uh, piece of my work uh, focuses on the price that's being paid by, I'm going to call it IT organizations, whether it's business or government whether the enterprise or, or governmental organization is large, medium, or small, it's the, it's the service largely through software that gets delivered to, uh, to an organization. For, sh for shorthand, during the presentation, I'll refer to business organizations, but know that we're referencing business, government, uh, and organizations uh, of all sizes. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the um, measurement process today, um, you may recognize the, um, the outline here that the BEA follows, which, which all of the statistical agencies uh, follow, uh, built on three commodities, prepackaged software, custom software, and own account software. The concern that the BEA and other organizations have had, uh, national statistical agencies have had to their credit, uh, have questioned themselves whether they are capturing the full extent of the decline in the software, then the price of software that's being delivered uh, across the business and government sector. The concern is that uh, the methodology that you see on the screen here uh, is undercounting the extent of the decline uh, that has been experienced uh, across uh, across the uh, the business world, if you will. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on topics. First, we're going to think about how software gets produced, what the production of software looks like uh, in, uh, in, and I'm gonna call, again, I'm, gonna, I'm going to call it the business sector. Secondly, we wanna focus in particular on the software producing sector. And I'll emphasize that we have a, a uh, software consuming section, the sector, the business sector, and a software producing sector which is the, the much larger software sector, or, or sorry, the much smaller software sector. Uh, we'll then focus on the, the business sector information and communication technology function in particular, uh, how the elements of um, production come together, the resources come together and the role that productivity plays, which will turn out to be critical. And then ultimately at the end, uh, show the price that uh, trend that that has uh, that has been realized. So let's first talk about software production. Software is being delivered, if you will, and functionality is being delivered across the business sector. There are a range of resources. So for many of you, I'm sure, uh, 
in terms of production functions, there is a, a left-hand side variable, which is software that's being delivered. We have right-hand side resources or inputs, which we show on the screen here, consisting of computing, communication, and storage services, which can either be on-premise or cloud services. Uh, we have software services, which now have, a, uh, as you can see, a range of capabilities, licensed software, software as a service, and open source software. Uh, labor services, that, which are largely software developers, but there are many other supporting roles that are necessary, all of which are locally or domestically produced. And then there's the importing, imported services. Uh, you'll notice that there is a distinction made here between services that are delivered capital services. That is, there is a stock of on-premise computing, for example, capability uh, versus those services that are purchased, for example, cloud services. And this is a distinction that we're going to make here as we go along uh, in, and turns out to have uh, quite important uh, implications. So as I indicated, we have a consuming sector, a business sector that, that consumes these resources. Uh, and in particular, it consumes the, the product or the output the software development sector. Um, the software development sector, of course, is a relatively small sector, uh, even though as footnote or parenthetically, uh, we we see in the media recent reports of significant number of layoffs from this sector. Um, even even counting those uh, those reductions in force, um, the the sector the, the numbers are small, even though it gets outside attention outsized attention uh, in the media. So we're thinking about. Uh, a, we're thinking about a two-sector model here. But in fact, there is a third important element here that we need to consider. Um, and that is the role of open source developers uh, as well, which has come to play a, a substantial and important role. Many of you will immediately realize that uh, there, are, there is an important distinction uh, between the software provided by the software sector and the, and the open source software, which of course is provided largely at a zero price, uh, which now implicates um, the, the measurement of the uh, price that organizations are paying for the collection of resources uh, depicted on the right-hand side of this chart. So we're, we have added levels of complexity. Just to fix ideas, to make uh, the, the, the notions here a bit more concrete, uh, consider uh, the application of customer relationship management software. Uh, many uh, will recognize the name uh, Salesforce, but there are other providers of CRM software which is a class of software that helps uh, both uh, business leaders capture and nurture customer relationships, which of course are most organizations, uh, a, a very important source of uh, intangible assets and intangible value, asset value reflected on the balance sheet. And of course, for sales leaders and sellers is uh, the data in support of their clients. So think of a, a row, if you will, in a CRM tool as consisting of a, a client company uh, and the columns consisting of the various important data points including information about that organization, who the buyers might be, uh, what sales opportunities might exist. Uh, many organizations um, ingest data from RM tool uh, with high frequency 
meaning daily and in some cases hourly. Um, but I also combine that, that data uh, with other tools and capabilities. Could be some open source capabilities that are allowing for analytics to be applied, increasingly machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities are being used to assess the probability that an opportunity might be won or lost, uh, or to forecast monthly, quarterly, annual sales and or uh, revenues. So this, this licensed software combined with other tools and capabilities, both hardware, software, and services, then delivers a capability, a software package, if you will, to users across an organization. Um, and while this uh, CRM software can be, um, as a result of a contractual relationship with a license or annual fee, it can also be purchased uh, as a service where each transaction uh, has a price associated with it. So this is, I think, a useful illustration or useful application or example uh, that demonstrates some of the complexity that we are trying to address here in this work. <clears throat> the other element here um, is a little bit of uh, mathematics, and I promise that the only chart that will show uh, any equations, but we need to be concerned not only with the, the resources, meaning the hardware, software, and services that are being applied here, but we also need to be concerned with the productivity of the software developers and the various teams um, that, are, uh, that are producing, uh, that are engaged with these resources to produce and deliver the service. And many of you will recognize equation number one here in the, the top panel of the chart uh, as being a standard uh, production function, labor productivity, uh, equation. Um, and many of you might also know, realize on the bottom part of the chart, there's some little bit of, uh, little bit of math we can do. Um, and we can specify a price equation, which brings together the resources that are being applied, the productivity that is being gained or lost, uh, in any given period, and all, all of this is on an annual basis. It is the second equation, equation number two here, the price index percentage change, that is the object of our endeavor. So we're looking to bring together the, the resources, the technology resources, uh, and account for the gains in productivity uh, that the, the various teams are realizing uh, as these services are delivered. Now, there are a number of changes that have occurred uh, over recent years that have caused much of the interest uh, in this work. Um, the original capability and methodology that was delivered the various national accounts developed in the late 1990s. So we're talking about work that was done and methods that were developed 25 years ago. As we all know, information and communication technology has changed dramatically over the 25 year period. Uh, not only had, um, had mobile devices such as the iPhone not been invented, uh, we didn't really have the uh, ubiquitous, uh, almost ubiquitous capability of internet services um, and other capabilities that we now have today. Of course, over the past decade, significant advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, neural nets, et cetera, which are increasingly uh, delivering service and capability that uh, was really in its infancy uh, over, over decades in the past. Um, as a result, we see uh, that there, the, the changes that have occurred is that um, software developers in particular 
that are applying new methods, capabilities, um, generally the, the software sector, so remember we're distinguishing between the business sector and the much smaller software sector, <clears throat> the software sector increasingly develop, uh, developing capabilities around uh, agile methods, DevOps methods are resulting in uh, significant productivity gains over time that of course, if they are widely shared, contribute to price reductions uh, within the, the business, the, the software and the, the prices of the services, the software that's being delivered within the business sector. Uh, one analogy that we'll point to here as we go along, uh, and of course, many of you who are uh, focused on the national accounts will realize that this functional approach across the information and communication technology sector is very similar to the functional approach with uh, research and development. There are, uh, there are research and development services that are external to many firms and that provide service to the firm much as there, as there are software uh, producing firms that provide software to the much larger business sector. So we'll rely on that um, analogy to some extent uh, as we go along here. The concern that we have and the challenge that we faced, have faced is how do we measure activity of information and communication technology teams within the business sector? What's the measure of productivity? Because of course, as teams become more productive, the implicit price that organizations are paying for that software and that service uh, is decreasing. Um, I am going to argue that uh, a reasonable measure is to be able to uh, use the soft, the productivity gains that we measure in the software sector as reflective of productivity gains that are analogously realized in the much broader business sector. Uh, the reason, there are a number of reasons for this, uh, one of which is that the, the software sector as a set of business entities engages in practices to deliver consistent quality, not only through the products that are developed, not only through their own product development process, but through their management of the delivery of those products uh, to their clients, uh, which smooths, smooths, if you will, the delivery of product and service in a quality fashion, uh, and therefore produces uh, a, uh, a relatively consistent uh, set of uh, productivity uh, advances. So we're going to argue that the software sector productivity, it, as measured, is increasingly representative of the broader software development productivity generally across the business sector. Um, one, one additional reason beyond just some of the structural uh, relationships is that we see that software as a service, one of the key inputs into the delivery of capability in the business sector, one of the key inputs uh, is increasingly purchased on as a service basis. Now you can see on the left-hand side of this chart that when we look wide uh, in 2016, compare that to uh, 2022, uh, the transactions that occurred uh, via a license or a fee decreased uh, and actually decreased at a rate of 1% per year, while software as a service was growing at almost 19% a year, which means that software that's being purchased uh, by the business sector uh, increase, increased from software as a service increased from a bit less than 50%, 48%, in 2016 to nearly three quarters, 3% 3 in 2002. So contained within this software as a service purchase is the productivity of software development. 
Basically, the nature to a development changing dramatically with the introduction of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. In the past, uh, a great deal of focus has been on the development of an application within a business organization. Increasingly, the focus across the business sector is what the time it takes to run the application. Um, as, as applications become more complex, sources of data uh, become uh, much larger, uh, multiple sources of data. Uh, as um, uh, graphics processing units become important for the, uh, the, the linear algebra calculations that exist within deep learning and neural net models, uh, all of this can be a time-consuming computing process. So the, the productivity, if you will, of software developers is less about writing lines of code. It is about the performance of the code and what it takes to run in a timely fashion. Just a brief anecdote, the firm that I spend some of my time working with it, Toronto-based software firm, we, as an illustration, had a client that was doing computing for transactions that ultimately <clears throat> had to be uh, used in a payment to a set of uh, financial advisors. It took uh, entirely an entire weekend to compute starting on a Friday evening and oftentimes continuing through into Monday morning. As a result of some significant rewriting of the code um, on our part, that application now runs in two hours. It means the, these accounts can be updated on a daily basis as opposed to uh, once a week. And it's that, it's that innovation uh, that land, lends to the productivity uh, of the of the application and of the ultimate uh, developers who are then applying that that work. As I mentioned a moment ago, um, an analogous concept here is the research and development function, which of course oftentimes stands side by side with the information and communication technology function in the national accounts. In many ways, they are uh, treated. Um, analogously, if you will, <clears throat> we're challenged uh, to measure the productivity of R&D teams. But there is work that, as you can see here in this chart, that has been done, <clears throat> excuse me, that in the past has uh, been able to find a third party source activity measure to be able to capture the gains that are being realized from a value perspective, the value being created by R&D teams uh, by looking at uh, scientific R&D service providers as they provide input to the business sector in the uh, R&D services that they purchase and, be, and suggesting perhaps that the productivity of these third-party providers is reflective of the productivity um, across, the, across the business sector. So for all these reasons, then, we're able to uh, focus on the software sector as an important input into this measurement process. We haven't yet focused uh, in this presentation on the on the measurement of the service delivered by the CT function in the business sector. We're still focusing now on the software sector that's developing applications um, because we need, to, we need to obtain for our work a productivity measure before we can move on to think about developing a price measure. So now, how would we measure productivity in the software sector is our next step here in this process. As you can see in this chart, uh, we are defining the software sector 
based on four NAICS codes. And I've provided some illustrations again to, to help to make things uh, concrete. Uh, and we have the software publishers, which is, uh, which is a well-known traditional group. We have uh, data processing and hosting services. Uh, we could add other to this list, some of which you'll recognize, such as Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, all of these hosting services are providing software tools and capabilities um, to, their, to their users. In some instances, in many instances, providing such software tools and capabilities and sent the use of their cloud capability. So it's, it's the overall complementarity uh, of the software tools uh, and the relationship to the consumption of the cloud services that are important from their business perspective. From our point of view, they are important tools that are available. And then thirdly, uh, I think the well-known computer systems design sector, uh, and there are many consulting firms two names of which you see uh, illustrated uh, on the chart. We have data uh, for both the uh, gross output um, in uh, chain dollars and in, in, in real terms. We also uh, have data for the sector employment uh, at, at a little bit of detail. Um, over the years, you can see uh, we have the computing and mathematics occupations in total, which means all of the, not only developers, but all of the support activity that is required. So that allows us then with the output and with the employment to be able to measure developer productivity. And you can see um, that as, as we might expect over this uh, substantial period, nearly 20 years, uh, productivity has been improving, uh, has been a, a, an, an improving trend. There was a, um, a period, interestingly enough, uh, in the uh, Great Recession and Financial Crisis of 2008-2009, where productivity improved dramatically as, as employment was reduced. So many of the gains that were realized um, continued um, with fewer employees. So productivity uh, improvement resulted, but then as hiring renewed in the 2011, 12, 13 time period, there were productivity flattened out. Productivity growth was, was actually negative for a, a year or two. But then with the more recent expansion of that sector, uh, we've seen uh, substantial productivity gains uh, as a result. So that then allows us to calculate the various uh, rates of change, of course, sim simple enough to do. Um, you can see at the bottom part of the chart here, we're talking about average productivity improvement that's in the two and a half percent to 3% range, uh, all of which seems uh, quite reasonable based on other uh, prior uh, estimates. So now we're ready to look at the business sector. The measure of productivity that we feel uh, can analogously be applied uh, to uh, business sector practices that will allow us to uh, measure the, the price at which software and related services and computing services are being delivered to the much broader set of users in the business sector. Uh, to remind you once again, thinking of this production function uh, framework where we have on the left-hand side, software that's being delivered to business users. And on the right-hand side, and you can see in this chart, we have um, listed a, a, a number of a number of inputs, eight separate inputs, um, three categories of software, two different formats of computing and communication technology. We have labor services that are directly applied domestically. We have imported services, which largely reflect the labor services 
uh, in third party countries, <coughs> excuse me, and we have to account for capital, meaning facilities, uh, infrastructure resources. Uh, you might imagine that there is um, human um, human resources, a human resource function, a finance function, uh, and many other business functions in support of information and communication technology functionality. Um, so I mentioned at the outset an important distinction here between services that are being provided by a stock of capital is those services that are being purchased as intermediate goods. So on the left-hand side of the chart, communication, computing, and software stocks are, are available uh, and being acquired and, and built, uh, which in turn provide a service. So the stock provides the service and from um, long-standing economics literature, we have the rental rate or the user price of capital, all of which is available um, in the case of the BEA from the integrated industry production account. Uh, some of you will know this as CLEMS data, which exists for um, many of the developed economies um, around the world. The alternative uh, is to purchase the same services uh, as a purchase service in the current period. And the price is the market price. In both cases, we have services that are coming from the stock of capital or a service that's being purchased. And in both cases, we have a price that, <coughs> that <coughs> we can use. And again, in the case of the BEA, there is a digital economy account, a satellite account that has been uh, set up and built and developed uh, over the years, as well as other data, all of which comes together uh, that I've displayed on the bottom part of the chart for software that's being delivered uh, by the business sector ICT function. So as an illustration, let's first look at a capital service being delivered. In this case, we're talking about communications equipment. So there is a stock of communications equipment. That stock is delivering a service. Um, and you can see on the chart that when we look at the data for the US, uh, the share of spending on this service uh, increased over this time period, 2006 to 2020, from roughly 13.5% uh, up to about 18.5% of the total spend uh, on uh, the IC, the business sector ICT function. And not surprisingly, over the same time period, you can see the decline uh, that occurred in the price of, of that service. So the rental rate, the user price of this capital uh, declined quite significantly. Uh, and you can see the, um, the scale uh, on the, the right-hand side of the chart. Now, um, a more complex uh, story is in computing, where in the computing space, we now have both the service that's being provided by the stock of computing equipment and storage equipment, as well as the cloud computing capability. On the left-hand side of the chart, you can see that the portion of uh, spending occurring for cloud computing was very limited in 2006. That was really the, the, the launch of these major cloud services, uh, most notably uh, uh, AWS, um, to 2020 when um, cloud services are estimated to include 40% of the total spend on computing uh, services. And you can see on the right-hand side uh, of the chart, uh, the uh, uh, rental uh, price uh, of um, capital services, uh, the rental rate, if you will, on the blue line, uh, and the uh, cloud services price index uh, in the uh, dashed line. Uh, we can talk uh, 
during the Q&A session, if, if you like, around the, the trends that we see here. Uh, but this is, uh, these trends are always a source of uh, some discussion and debate. We need to bring those together. We need to weight them together through an index process so that for the computing and storage resources being brought to bear by the business sector, we then have the weighted, the, the weighted average of both the share of spend that you see, uh, as well as the, uh, the price index uh, and, and what the, the trend has been uh, in pricing. That then brings us to software. Um, and in the software case, we have not only complexity of that we saw in the, in the computing space where, where we have a stock service. In the case of software, we have licensed software that exists as a stock of software capital and a service, software as a service. We have a third element, which is open source software. For this work, we're making use of some quite good work that Shane Greenstein and his collaborators uh, have produced uh, are in the web server space. And you can see on the chart here that the uh, Apache so uh, web service software, which is um, uh, the, the open source, the, the largest open source, uh, and Microsoft, which is in the, in the blue line, which is the more traditional um, uh, paid service, you can see that they, they have been somewhat diverging trends uh, over time where, where the open source piece of this has become more important. And we can show on the next chart here, the two, uh, the, the, um, the, the mix, the usage of the two, where open source has now become uh, almost 70% of the total in this category. So we're gonna make the assumption that this category uh, is representative uh, of the broader software category uh, and the penetration of open source um, in, in, these, uh, in, in these calculations. That then allows us to bring together all of the elements of software. We have software capital, we, uh, ca capital services, we have uh, as, as a service software, we have open source software. And we can see that, first of all, if you look at the blue line, look at the axis on the left-hand side, you can see that the, the software piece of the total, of course, uh, is nearly 50%. Uh, it's an important part of the total set of resources of the software being delivered, which seems reasonable. Um, it, uh, as a share of spend, had been declining for a period, uh, but has now uh, become even more important as, as its price has continued to decline uh, at a fairly, a fairly healthy pace. Finally, we have two other elements. One is labor services. We have developers we have to pay for. Um, and you can see here, uh, notice on the, the right-hand side of the chart uh, with the, the red dashed line, the hourly wage rate for developers uh, in the data that we, we have available to us from BLS uh, has gone from roughly $43 per hour up to almost $60 per hour over this time period. Not surprisingly, uh, the total spend on labor services has declined from something that was a little bit more than 15% to about 11% of the total. And then we also have to account for services. There are, as, as I'm sure many will be aware, um, quite significant resources, quite um, significant talent available. Um, in uh, non-domestic locations <clears throat> for many um, organizations in the developed nations, relying upon uh, quite important talent pools in India and in Eastern Europe, uh, in uh, Bratislava, Budapest, and Bucharest. Coincidentally, uh, three, three important cities all beginning with the letter B. Uh, but all important uh, Eastern European sources of talent and capability. So we are importing here services which are largely consist of software, Imp importing software 
based on labor services existing in a third party country. We also have to be able to calculate now multi-factor productivity, as we, as we said at the outset, by bringing together all of these resources, weighting them as a share of the total, uh, and accounting for the improvement, the labor productivity improvement. Um, and then, and we see here the, the trend in multi-factor productivity and the percentage change um, from year to year. Um, a little bit volatile uh, because of the, uh, the shifts that have occurred around macroeconomic events, I would assert. Uh, but nonetheless, continued, <clears throat> continued improvement from the beginning, you can see that at the beginning of the period, the index uh, was at a value of roughly 0 0.91. Uh, despite some volatility at the end of the period, the index was at uh, a, a value of roughly 1.01. .01, so gains in multi-factor productivity uh, over this time period. All of which then comes together with our end result, which is, we want to be able to produce a price index. Um, and we can see the blue line here is the price index falling from a value of a little bit more than 1.3 uh, over this time period down to a value of roughly about 0 0.7. Um, and you can see with the red dashed line, the percentage change um, from year to year. Now, how does this, comp what are the elements, first of all, that contribute to this price decline, and how does it compare to what's been published um, uh, over, the, over recent years? So we have this experimental price index, and we want to compare it to the published price index and understand what, which of the elements of the, of the model here, of the analytics, have contributed to the, to the declines. So on the left-hand side of this chart, we see that for the U.S., um, the, uh, the existing price index has been, had declined over this five-year period from 2015 to 2020 at roughly 1%, a little bit more than 1%. And you can look across to the right-hand side of the chart, and you can see that with all of the elements brought together, uh, the price index was declining at a little bit more than 7% over this time period. The major contributor to this decline has been the introduction into the methodology of the capital services through the CLEMS data, if you will, or the integrated uh, industry account. The reason being that the, the rental rate of if you will, capital and the capital services uh, better captures the decline in the pricing of those services or those resources than the traditional approach relying upon the three commodities that we displayed at the outset of the presentation, prepackaged software, own account software, um, and uh, custom software. You can see that, in fact, uh, with the, introducing the cloud computing capability, um, actually, uh, to some extent, reduces that price decline, going from more than a 7% decline to a, a bit more than a 6% decline. And that has to do with the pricing of cloud computing services, which have been in uh, significant demand uh, with the prices of cloud computing not falling as rapidly over this time period as have other resources. And then finally, of course, with the introduction of uh, open source software, which of course has a zero price, that then essentially offsets um, the impact of the cloud computing pricing strategies uh, that have been pursued. Now, finally, what does this mean in terms of the broader uh, national accounts uh, you can see, first of all, that GDP perspective, uh, this would have added one-tenth of a percent to the, to the GDP growth rate in the U.S. Uh, over this time period, uh, would obviously also the growth rate of fixed uh, investment 
gross private fixed investment, fixed investment, non-residential investment, and of course, software investment as well. You can see in the software row in the middle of the chart uh, going from um, a growth rate of 9.7% to 15.7%, which is a six percentage point increase, which is exactly the difference between the minus one and the minus seven that you saw on the previous chart. Software investment, of course, uh, then becomes a larger piece of the total. The very bottom row of the chart, you can see that non-residential fixed investment, um, software as a percent of non-residential fixed investment was a bit less than 20% uh, in 2020 as published uh, in the method as proposed here. It's about uh, 25%. So it's about a 6% gain um, in terms of its importance uh, in the overall mix. So I, I, I think we're just about through this. And I just wanted to finally end the presentation by mentioning that the work I've been doing here is a, is a piece of my broader research agenda which is captured in the work that was published in uh, late September uh, around the, the whole notion that technology uh, is, has the potential, the changes that we're seeing in, in the technology space has the potential to improve uh, growth overall, not just because of measurement, but importantly in, in how work is being done. And my assertion here is uh, in simplest terms, that the, the technology that's beginning to become available, if we see significant transformation in how work is done, not only in terms of the technology diffusion and the business leadership, but also the transformation uh, of, among workers, and there's some early signs that we're seeing a little bit of this, uh, can, can perhaps uh, improve overall growth, productivity growth, and perhaps even uh, more equal income distribution. And I propose a growth and fairness agenda as, as part of this from a public policy perspective. So let me stop there. Uh, and Rebecca, I'll turn it back to you um, and, uh, and open it up for further discussion. Thank you very much, Martin. That's a fantastic talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A yet. Please, uh, participants, do, do type in your questions uh, for Martin, and we will um, ask you to, to, to speak directly. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the Q&A box here. Um, yeah, so, so, so very, very, uh, so some significant changes by t in, in the in the um, growth numbers uh, from from taking on these changes that you you um, you've proposed here. I mean, you you showed you showed um, how how the, this new deflator would alter some of the some of the um, some of the growth picture, the investment picture, etc. I mean, have, are you aware of of others who have? Done related work in this space and sort of the magnitudes of um, of the changes that they find uh, in both in terms of of how prices have changed, but also in terms of the implications for um, for growth metrics, etc. Yeah, there was some there was some early work done that the that the BEA uh, here in the U.S. Uh, had um, had done, led by Carol Corrado that did arrive at a productivity gain uh, in the 3% range, uh, which is consistent with uh, what I had, had shown earlier. Um, but also, as I, in, as I indicated in the presentation, I think this is the first work that's been able to incorporate the CLEMS data and the capital services uh, into, into the mix. And that's been the been the added piece um, that is uh, novel to this work, but uh, from a productivity perspective, consistent with some of the early work that was done, which then um, encouraged, if you will, or spurred on the BEA to uh, to ask uh, to have this additional work uh, undertaken. Okay, 
I can see we have a, a, a thanks very much, Mark. We have a question from uh, Rachel Soloveitchik. Um, Rachel, if, if uh, you can unmute your microphone. Sure. Uh, this is more, this is a very theoretical question. I don't know if you can ever answer it, but it seems like a lot of the software your improvements you're talking about are really sort of business process improvements where they figure out a better way to do the same thing. And this type of business process improvements existed long before computers. But say if you have a filing system and you figure out how to file things, you know, in an easy to use manner. So just is there any way in which the software, you know, can be traced back to this older thing and did software make business process faster? improvements or is it just a long-term trend? Yeah, no, Rachel, that's a great question. Thank you for the question. Um, you're right that, uh, and in fact, this gives me an opportunity uh, to point to my book, uh, which looks at four industrial revolutions, which uh, really introduces not just uh, four different quite significant technology eras, but also the transformation in how work is done. The challenge, of course, uh, is uh, the available data. Uh, so to, and that, that was a, a bit of a challenge in, do, in, in doing the work for the book as well. And we, once we get really prior to 1945 or 1950, the data become a lot thinner. Um, uh, now, there, are, there have been some recent innovations, but nonetheless, the data are more limited. But you're absolutely right that we've seen uh, very, a, a whole range of technologies introduced over time uh, associated with significant transformation in how work is done. And where, where we are focused here on the ICT function is just really the latest patient, if you will, the latest representation of these epochs of technological change and associated transformation uh, in the way in the way work is done. So it's it's a terrific, terrific thought um, and um, an important piece of the overall picture here. Thank you. Um, and uh, please, participants, um, if you have any questions, now's the chance to to, to ask them. Um, Martin, um, I mean, one, one of the, so you mentioned when you're talking about, about your book here and, and maybe partially related to what Rachel is saying, that there's lots of opportunities here for uh, productivity gains going forward. Um, but also, of course, uh, these measurement innovations that you're describing um, also add to productivity growth. I guess we, we would translate the GDP differences you calculate as direct productivity gains um, mm -hmm. or labor productivity gains in any case. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a, I think there's a sort of a divided view on, 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 um, on this, but, you know, some, some have argued that a lot of the productivity slowdown that we've seen, or some of the productivity slowdown that we've seen since the early 2000s in advanced economies, is partially reflected by our, um, you know, lack of keeping pace uh, on, on an economic measurement front with these new technologies, for example. And uh, you know, your 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 um, numbers here would certainly uh, suggest that that's partially the case. Um, but others have said. Um, that, you know, we had these um, mismeasurement issues before in the past, and therefore um, innovations like the ones you've just proposed here wouldn't necessarily um, help us explain uh, any bit of the productivity slowdown. What would, you, what would you say to that? Yeah, so that's a terrific question. How do we parse the slowdown and in, in productivity growth between... Um, the, uh, between an actual slowdown versus a, mi a mismeasurement. Uh, if we take the US, for example, over the period of 1945 to 1975, roughly, productivity uh, improved at about 2.5% per year, just to take a round number. In more recent years, I think there's general agreement in the US that productivity growth has been around a percent and a half. So there's one percentage point difference how much of that is measurement? How much of that is actual slowdown in productivity? 
I would assert most of it is an actual slowdown in productivity improvement, um, allowing that there is there are measurement issues. Uh, I would also suggest that in the earlier er era, the prior to 1975, because we were in an, in an economic environment and the nature of economic activity was much more commodity and manufacturing based, the measurement challenges were a little bit easier to address. So while they weren't perfect, they probably were closer. Um, the, the error was probably less than it is today. Uh, you're right that we've shown here one example of where we may find um, a tenth of a percentage point improvement um, because we have unpriced, in part because we have unpriced services. Uh, and uh, importantly, I showed in the last chart, because the nature of activity has shifted from the purchase of commodities to the use of capital services. We can also we also can think of how these these trends, if you will, this the how this economic activity is impacting not just the ITC function, but consumers and and business functions generally. Uh, all of the work, for example, that uh, Eric Brian Olufsen has done around the pricing, uh, the shadow price of search, the shadow price of email, uh, the importance, for example, of the WhatsApp application in Europe versus the importance of the search application in the US. Uh, the fact that many banking services are available at zero cost to the consumer. Uh, the, uh, the zero cost of social networks, um, if you will. Um, so there are many services now that are available at zero, zero cost that create significant value that's not being captured. I would assert maybe another tenth or two percentage point. So of the one percentage point decline, we still have six, seven, eight tenths of a percentage point that we need to explain uh, in another form or fashion. Um, I, I will also point out uh, there is work that we, we all did uh, through Brookings um, looking at measurement uh, in much across many, many different um, functions and sectors and industries that will uh, become available through a book that's being published at, at later this year. Um, so the measurement issue uh, will continue to get attention, but it's, uh, I, would, I would suggest it's a smaller piece of the, of the productivity slowdown. Thank you for your thoughts on that. So, so um, we have a, a question here from Leo Sveikaskas. Um, Leo, would you, uh, would you like to unmute your microphone? and pose your question. Perhaps I can, I can ask it. So uh, Leo is asking, what do you think of the hypothesis that R&D has consistently been uh, coming more custom and more researchers are needed for the same amount of progress? Well, as I indicated, the work that Dennis Fixler and uh, collaborators did now a few years ago, uh, looking at uh, third party uh, R&D service providers uh, is, a, is a useful way to try to measure uh, <coughs> productivity in the R&D sector. Um, there's certainly uh, a, a hypothesis that, that has been advanced by Nick Bloom and others um, of uh, productivity being less, uh, sorry, R&D being less productive than it has in the past. Um, however, I would assert very difficult measurement issues, uh, very hard to measure as, as, the, as the paper that I, that I referenced um, indicates. Um, so it's really quite difficult to know. Um, my, if, if we go back to the, the broad, my broader research agenda in my, in my book, I assert that critical element, there are two critical elements. One is time, taking time for the machine learning and artificial intelligence technology to be developed and deployed so that it's relatively easy to use with wide adoption be diffused 
from large organizations to small and medium organizations. So the technology is continuing to progress, but time is required. And number two, uh, for workers and business leaders to be willing to engage in the nature of the transformation necessary to capture the value of that technology. So, so all of this broader technology diffusion and, and the transformation is impacting the measured productivity of the R&D sector. Mm. Okay. Thank you. We have we have uh, one more question from um, Rachel Soloveitchik, which uh, I know we're, we've, we've come up against the hour, but um, I'd still like to give Rachel the chance to ask the question. Sure. Well, this isn't so important, but you're talking so much about business uh, software, but there's also a lot of video games. And there's this whole other literature that video games are sort of making people drop out of the labor force. And... Are video games getting that much better and are we not measuring PCE prices? So, so I agree, Rachel, that, that's an important question. It's, it's gonna be a smaller piece of the total, I expect, and just in terms of spending. Uh, my estimate is that the business and government sectors are spending something in excess of the US, just for the US alone, something in excess of $2 trillion a year. The gaming sector is a little bit smaller. But I agree, the same measurement issues are gonna apply. And as you point out, the implication of your question, the same social, political, and economic implications uh, are, apply as well, uh, and the impact on the labor market. So that is another uh, very interesting question that I'm sure deserves some work. And maybe you and I can figure out how to do that at some point. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I think we're going to have to close here. Uh, Martin, thank you very much for, uh, for all this work and for the excellent talk. Um, it'd be great if we started to see statistical agencies taking on board these changes. Um, and thanks to, thanks to um, Rachel and Leo for your questions and thanks to the audience for joining us. Um, just a quick advert, please join us in two weeks time on the 9th of February. We'll have a seminar with Ralph Martin from the LSE on efficient industrial policy for innovation. Thanks again, Martin. My pleasure.